Hello, hello everyone. So, I know we usually do lives on Friday nights, but this weekend I am in London uh, because it is one of my best friends, Zoe, who you may have seen on this channel, is getting married quite soon and there's quite a lot of wedding things happening this weekend. So I've popped over here to participate in wedding celebrations, which means that uh, I, while while this video is airing, uh, I will be mid-wedding extravaganza. Um, so I thought I would just quickly uh, film a little, a little Friday video to make up for the fact that we're not doing uh, something live tonight. And I'm really excited about what I decided to do this video about because we're going to talk about the time that England and France were almost one country. You may not have heard this story, but things got very close to a, a single country that was both England and France. I'm going to tell you about how that happened, why it happened, and how it was stopped by dysentery. By the way, I just want to apologize that the audio is not the best in this video. I have had to record the voiceover while walking around central London, so I've done my best. So to tell you this story, I'm going to go to one of my favorite places in London, uh, that, that central hub of history nerds, the National Portrait Gallery. So you can actually see contemporary portraits of several of the people involved in this story. The National Portrait Gallery is in central London, just around the corner from Trafalgar Square. And the entire idea of the museum is to bring history to life through portraits. Every piece of art you see in this museum will be a portrait. It's free to get in, but you can make a voluntary donation if you feel so inclined. And they have portraits ranging from the Tudor period to slightly more recent. So let's start with a flashback. The year is 1415 and Henry V is the King of England. Henry is a little unsure of his power because his father, Henry IV, was a usurper. He killed the rightful king to become the king himself. So there's some question about if there's going to be a rebellion against Henry since technically he should not be directly in line to the throne. So what's the best way to maintain your power if you're the king by a really shaky standard? start a war with France. <laughs> so Henry decides to come over to France and reassert his ancestors' claims to the French throne. So in 1415, he sails across to France and rekindles the Hundred Years' War between England and France. This is Henry V, and this particular portrait of him is not in this museum, but I did want to show it to you because the reason he is in profile, which is a little interesting tidbit, is that he was shot in the face by an arrow as a teenager doing a battle. So all the portraits of him are in profile or slightly angled to hide the scar from the arrow on the other side of his face. So Henry sails over to France and has an unprecedented amount of military success against superior French forces. And finally in 1420, he forces the King of France, Charles VI, who by the way, I will definitely be doing a video on later on. He, he was known as Charles the Mad and he thought he was made out of glass. It's fascinating. Anyway, um, he forces Charles VI to sign a treaty because he had conquered most of the north of France, including Paris. And in the treaty, it's stipulated that Henry is from that moment forward, the region of France, that Henry gets to marry the daughter of Charles VI, the princess of France, and that upon Charles' death, Henry will become the heir to the French throne and inherit and become king of France and England, making them effectively one country. If this had happened, this would have meant that there was one king who was the legitimate king of both countries and probably much like England and Scotland, they would have eventually been combined into one United Kingdom, but instead of it being the United Kingdom we have today, it might very well have included France. However, this did not happen. This is Charles VI. This portrait is also not in this museum because they tend to focus more on English historical figures and he obviously was King of France. In 1422, Henry was laying siege to the town of Meaux, and during the siege, he contracted dysentery and died at the age of 35. Here's the kicker, only a few weeks before his father-in-law, Charles VI of France. In other words, if he had lived a few more weeks, he would have been a powerful monarch who could take over the throne of France and enforce the deal that he had made with Charles, saying that he was the heir. But because he had died, the new ruler was his only months old infant son, Henry VI. 
And this, I'll say, is where we get interesting based on where we are today, because now I can start to show you some very specific portraits that were painted at the time that these people were alive. I love this portrait of Henry VI because here he is all grown up and it's such a typical portrait of this part of the late medieval period, the early, beginning of the early modern period. People were often painted from the chest up like this and facing slightly on a diagonal. And the really, really typical thing is that they're showing the hands just in the bottom of the picture and they're showing two hands because he was the king, he was very wealthy obviously, and he was able to afford to have the artist paint two hands, which was the most expensive thing to have in your portrait, is a hand or two hands. People who didn't want to spend quite as much money on their portrait had no hands. They probably mostly had hands in real life, it's, it's just in the painting. Because Henry VI was busy being a literal baby, Many different English nobles took over the guardianship of the new territory in France, but predictably they soon had a lot of problems with infighting amongst themselves, which left them in a weakened position when a certain teenaged heroine you might have heard of turned up in 1429. There she is, Joan of Arc. Again, she's a French historical figure, so not in this museum. But the thing that always strikes me about her is that she was so young, she was just a teenager, and she led France to freedom. She truly was the Doogie Hauser of God's religious emissaries to free the Kingdom of France. After France won back its independence with the help of Jeanne d'Arc, uh, Henry VI's problems got even worse because the Wars of the Roses took hold in England. It was a full-blown civil war, and in the end, Henry VI lost his crown to Edward IV. I am just going to keep going a little bit farther ahead in history here because France is going to come back into the story briefly but importantly. Once the Wars of the Roses wound down, the last man standing was Edward IV, who became King Edward IV. He didn't really pursue trying to gain back the French territory. He was too busy trying to hold the kingdom together after a massive civil war. So the new king, Charles VII in France, was able to really secure his power and lock down his position during Edward IV's reign. At the end of Edward IV's reign, his younger brother, the man, the legend, the villain, Richard III, came to power. It's debatable whether he did this by killing his own nephews or that's just sort of how things played out after someone else murdered his nephews. There's a lot to be discussed on this subject, and as Laurent knows, you don't want to get me started. So we'll move on to the man who dethroned Richard and killed him at the Battle of Bosworth, taking the throne for himself. It's Henry VII. Henry VII was the first of the Tudor kings, and the way that France ties back into our story is that while Richard was king, Henry VII had to be exiled in France, hiding out at the court of Charles VII to avoid being murdered as a rival claimer to the throne. Henry VII did a pretty good job as king after all that turmoil, but his place in history is a little bit overshadowed by his extremely famous son, or his even more famous granddaughter. And on a, on a total side note, I just want to point out how cool it is that Tudor fashion makes everyone look like a fancy pirate. Look at that fancy pirate pearl earring. Well, that's the end of today's little history video, and I hope you guys enjoyed this. I really had fun. Uh, walking around and finding the portraits and just kind of really diving into this story, which is, I think, really, really interesting. But uh, I guess I'll, I'll finish up by saying that uh, if you're new here, please, please do take a minute to subscribe because uh, we do a lot of um, history-related content on this channel as well as renovating uh, Everdeen House, which is the house that I own in France, and uh, we're, we're working on it slowly but surely, um, which is very historical as well. And also please do like this video because that is very, very helpful. And finally, a huge, huge thank you to the patrons because you guys are amazing. Thank you for being patrons. Thank you for supporting this channel. Thank you for supporting everything. And with that, I'm going to go and get ready to do some wedding-related activities. And I will see you guys next time.